Good afternoon. Hi, hello everybody. I'm sorry I was <laughs> late because I have to finish uh, some event in prayer as well. So how are you? Thank you. Very fine. Yes, yes. So thank you very much. Uh, let me start and also introduce yourself. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good night, everybody. Selamat malam. Uh, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Uh, pada malam hari ini, kita akan menyelenggarakan perkuliah umum dengan dosen tamu dari University of Depression. Dan saat ini beliau itu adalah Dr. Zo atau Dr. Ainozo. Beliau adalah salah satu tenaga uh, pendidik atau dosen yang ada di Faculty of Law, Asyokto Dumanyikar, Depreseni Egyetemen, atau dari Fakultas Hukum Universitas Depresen. Dan beliau uh, merupakan uh, salah satu dosen dan juga peneliti yang aktif khususnya dalam bidang hukum perdata internasional. Dan beliau menempuh S1 itu dahulu di University of Hamburg Law School di Jerman, kemudian University Depresen, kemudian S2 beliau ada di uni, uh, S3 beliau itu ada University of Miskolc, Dirk Ferenc PhD Law School. Kemudian uh, beliau sangat aktif uh, mengikuti kursus-kursus dan pernah mendapatkan Master Tutor Gold Medal by Hungarian Scientific Students uh, pada tahun 2017. Saya ya. satu ini, siap tuh aku nggak bisa. Uh, mendapatkan Award for Consumer Protection by the Ministry of Innovation and Technology. Dan uh, beliau juga pernah uh, apa menempati beberapa posisi penting. Saat ini beliau posisinya adalah sebagai Hungarian Association of Consumer Protections. Dan juga di saat yang bersamaan beliau juga menjabat sebagai Arbitration Board of IDPR County sebagai presiden. Dan juga University of Civil Law Department di uh, sebagai senior lecturer sejak tahun 2006 sampai sekarang. Dan malam hari ini kita membahas tentang prinsip-prinsip dan tendensi dari hukum perdata internasional yang ada di Uni Eropa. So, without further ado, I would like to ask Professor Dr. Haina to start uh, your presentation and after in uh, after 30 minutes or maybe 45 minutes then we will have a session of discussion so welcome dr so thank you very thank you very much uh, first of all uh, i'm unbelievably grateful uh, for this invitation for this wonderful event uh, and of course to see dodik once again Mm -hmm. uh, because it uh, it always reminds us, not just me from the faculty, then then anybody else and any other colleagues of us, that first of all, uh, his very kind personality, and Thank secondly, um, secondly that the time so quickly goes by. Yes, it's already I don't know, a couple of years. Very fast. Ago. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we were still younger yeah. than than you when you visited uh, or or LLM and and PhD uh, school. So, and you were you were one of our early bird. We are unbelievably proud of 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 you and 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 um, yeah, your progress as well. Uh, as you all surely recognize that um, I'm particularly um, professor of, of international private law and my uh, another hobby or fields of interest is consumer protection. This is what I'm what I'm doing in the practice. And of course, the two main subjects uh, of my research has has a very, very common uh, common field. 
and uh, and crossing field as well, especially the the so-called cross-border uh, private relations, the cross-border uh, consumer contracts. Um, <clears throat> for this event, uh, when we were uh, talking or uh, corresponding uh, on the subject of this event, <laughs> I've uh, I have proposed that. Uh, the most reasonable thing would be if I if I would have a a, a, sh a short lecture on the on the current tendencies of the European international private law uh, in general, um, picking a very uh, few examples uh, of of interesting cases of tendencies how the European legislator can influence. Uh, the member states' uh, legislatory activity, how the European Court of Justice can, uh, can have a very strong effect and influencing power on, um, on, 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 on construction of, uh, of the international private law uh, of the member states uh, and of the European Union at the same time. And... Um, and the reform uh, and progress of the international private law, the European way, uh, how, how can it be compared with, with other, for example, the American uh, way of, uh, of, uh, of the progress of the development. So um, um, having attention and my eyes on this goal, uh, I, I I try to plan and put together uh, the agenda of the of the two days lecture. Hope you will enjoy it. Um, first of all, I, I I'm trying to give you a, a very short introduction and uh, uh, and and the focuses. Afterwards, uh, I would like to talk talk very shortly on uh, on what do we. Uh, mean under the international private law? What is the European sense of uh, the international private law uh, as itself? Then uh, I also want wanted to give you uh, a, a very... You uh, eat very... Yeah, um, so is it okay? Yes, yes, Can it's you... okay. Please yeah. continue. Okay. Sorry, there was uh, uh, noise. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. So nothing, nothing concerning me. Yes. 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 Um, then, um, then I would like to give you very, very short and very few interesting pieces of the of the international private law development from the past. Um, we would go to the role of the European Union. I would highlight a few typical problems and new solutions. Then. A few selected examples of the legislatory outputs, uh, and of course, interesting questions and and topics on clash or crash of laws, the role of the public order in the European Union and the member states. If you have any question, I don't know. Um, if so, from my side, uh, it's up to you. you can you can also interrupt me or send me in the chat box. Or uh, as I've uh, as I've heard the uh, the agenda of the two days lecture, we gonna have uh, uh, time for uh, for having it. So um, let's go uh, first of all to the to the introduction and the focuses. Uh, since um, since the time frame is uh, is only enough for for making a little bit more understandable how the European Union and how the European Union's legislation regarding to the international private law works and functions, um, um, uh, I, will, I will give you uh, a very, very short um, uh, introduction of how the, how the EU, the European Union in this regard mm -hmm. works. Uh, why is it important for the European Union to adopt measures regarding to the international private law? Uh, and basically, what does this kind of uh, legislatory activity uh, has to do uh, with the internal market? Um, 
since I'm uh, I'm dealing mainly uh, with the substantial law, with the material law, which always reflects on the question which law to apply for uh, the the various uh, private uh, uh, private relations uh, if they if they contain a foreign element, so with international aspects, uh, I will always focus on this. Uh, but of course, my uh, my lecture uh, in general will will also con concern or will be linked to the uh, to the procedural uh, side as well. So, what do we mean under uh, private international law? So, from this perspective, uh, and uh, and and being aware that uh, your private international law, private law, particularly have a European Lovely. background. Uh, background as well. I think uh, all over the world, the private international law uh, has almost the same definition. Um, under the European scholar, uh, we uh, we use it, the private international law, international private law in uh, two main uh, approaches. The narrow approach uh, always uh, uh, contains uh, those kind of rules which which try to guide the judge, the forum, um, um, which law finally to apply uh, to the private relations. In the wider approach, uh, not just the questions uh, and the solutions for finding the lex causae, the applicable law for private relations will be relevant, then um, the procedural questions as well. Which court will have jurisdiction to hear the case in cross-border issues? Uh, and and once a foreign judgment was uh, uh, was taken, uh, was launched, uh, um, can it be recognized and enforced in a foreign country, in a different country? So other than uh, in an uh, other than and it was uh, it was previously or firstly taken. Um, <clears throat> if we are uh, if we are trying to um, uh, emphasize the um, uh, the main character of the private international law rules as a norm, uh, it is always a kind of empty law. We will never find the direct solution for all uh, for. Uh, for all a problem to decide as a judge, we will only find, uh, so it's a kind of toolbox uh, in order to find the applicable law, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the court which will have finally jurisdiction to hear the case and how to recognize uh, or, or enforce foreign judgments. So it, it is a very interesting toolbox. Uh, it needs a very deep uh, private law knowledge. And of course, um, it, uh, uh, it also requires a very comparative uh, uh, approach and scarce. Um, back, to, back to one of the main questions of uh, uh, for which or what kind of relations, private relations, uh, can be used, uh, the private international law, uh, we would easily or simply say that, of course, international uh, private relations. But what does it mean, international? What does this mean? Is there any foreign element in the nation? But from which source can, can this foreign element arise in the private relation? Because finally, it will uh, it will influence or it will uh, yeah it will influence the final or final statement whether this conflict or whether this relation is just a pure domestic one or it's an international one. So international uh, uh, private relation with relevant foreign element, um, the private international international law rules should be applied in order to find the final applicable law. In any other pure domestic cases, there is no clash of uh, and no crash or conflict of 
potentially applicable laws. There is only one law to apply, uh, and this is not a question anymore. But defining what is an international element and what is relevant international element, um, it has many, many methods and, and some new releases uh, from the uh, from the very few uh, years past. Um, I would say that uh, that the legislator is uh, is mainly interested in to keep and maintain all of the or most of the private relations under the scope under the scope of the domestic law. It can be reached, so this can be reached through totally different means as well. Uh, one of the very uh, uh, several uh, used method of the private international law uh, to make the context and the application, the scope of the private international law rules a little bit wider, uh, extending the scope of the private inter international rules for those kind of uh, uh, situations where normally a different a foreign law should be applied. So this happens many times. When, when an internal uh, public interest is behind the issue. For example, in the inheritance succession cases, uh, the, general, uh, the general rule under the, uh, or, or at least was previously, uh, um, under the national laws that, uh, that, uh, that the person who died uh, the nationality, uh, uh, the nationality of the person, the law of the nationality should uh, should be uh, should be applied. Um, for example, but in between, the whole concept uh, has been uh, has been changed. Um, if somebody gone lost uh, till uh, till claiming or till stating that uh, he or she was uh, was uh, the Member states and the national laws mostly requiring uh, some duration of time. In the Hungarian law, this is five years. In other laws, it can be even more and more. But till, based on, for example, a foreign person's nationality, uh, the Hungarian authorities cannot state and claim that the last person can be seen as dead in order to uh, in order to issue the succession request it can cause an uncertain domestic situation especially when there is a widow with a hungarian nationality in this issue there is already a domestic public interest behind the issue which will make uh, uh, which will make uh, the Hungarian the Hungarian law extension uh, to another separate situation, which normally would be uh, would be solved or would be uh, 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 issued by the uh, by the national law. So, if the party was a Greekish citizen, for example, where the Greek law uh, requires uh, a longer extension after uh, after getting lost. In, uh, in order to claim finally that uh, he he or she can be seen seen uh, dead, um, in a very in this example the Hungarian law exceptional can be applied for this situation. But this is a method of the private international law. Another method of the legisl of the, of the legislator to put uh, uh, pr to put private international law rules. Uh, and cover them in the substantial law. Um, if you think on, um, for example, data protection, most of the European, uh, most of the European member states and the European Commission itself uh, uh, discussing that the big tech uh, firms uh, of Google, Meta, and uh, uh, and Facebook storing the data of European citizens under the American law in American located servers. What is the problem with, the, with this? From the 
American parties, business entities uh, point of view, basically nothing, because uh, it is not bound to a location. And of course, they will bring the data uh, into some different uh, countries, legislatory uh, 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 products, data protection uh, rules under data protection rules uh, scope. Um, yeah, maybe avoiding the stronger European data protection rules, uh, rules application. But of course, the European Union and the Commission, and of course the member states, the citizens themselves have problem with this. Uh, but how to solve this basically cross-border issue? Uh, the cross-border issue was solved uh, putting direct uh, uh, rules into the substantial law that, uh, for example, uh, the European citizens' uh, data should be uh, uh, should be treated under the scope of the European Data Protection Act. Uh, this is exactly something which can which can solve and which can, which can treat the conflict uh, between two uh, clashing uh, and crashing uh, laws. The same situation with, uh, for example, commercial practices. If a commercial practices uh, acted from abroad, from a third country out of the European Union, maybe America, maybe from Asia, uh, have a look at the TEMU, the new uh, online marketplace, uh, which has boomed right now in Europe at least. You cannot open a YouTube video uh, and you cannot open a, uh, uh, or make a Google search without having uh, broadcasting and uh, advertisements from, from the TEMU. Um, what can we do against such a, a commercial practice, such a very aggressive and sometimes misleading commercial practice if it was done by somebody who is located and seated out of the European Union. This can be also a very pure conflict between, uh, between the European Union and its member states, and of course, the, uh, another competitor located and seated out of the European Union. The substantial law says that the European law or the member states law should be applied uh, in situation if the commercial practice is directed into one or more member states. So that's a pure rule which aims to uh, solve the conflict between potentially uh, applicability of different laws. So this was, this was put uh, into the substantial law. And of course, it was created or, or recreated as a kind of domestic debate uh, because, uh, because the whole situation wasn't solved with the methods and tools of the private international law. But the latest release of the European Court of Justice concerning issue was uh, that, uh, uh, that the international element um, of the parties' contract uh, was based, wasn't based on objective connections. It was on subjective connections. The subjective connection was that the parties who had basically nothing to do with foreign elements, they were coming from the, from the same, so you can see the, uh, uh, the parties, uh, these were from... Excuse me. Doctor, yeah. uh, can you go down for the PowerPoint? Because we cannot see it. Or maybe you can show it the PowerPoint. So I've, so the, the decision you mean, uh, so Wait, what I've seen is- The PowerPoint uh, still in number one slide. Yeah, can you this go is... further? So or I've, maybe... so the number maybe... one, which one? Yeah, the agenda the or one. the title? It's no, I mean, the PowerPoint is not moving. The can PowerPoint you... is not moving. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this is moving, moving at my side, at least. Oh, maybe you can try to stop it and then uh, share again. Share okay, screen. maybe I'll, I will do this. Otherwise, I can send it to you and maybe yes, you can yes, yes, yes. move it. Okay, so I will send it to you right now and I will try to, uh, but at the same time, I will try to share it once again. And... Yeah. Uh, 
and let's see how it works. Okay, no. So still not moving. It's not moving, but oh yes, it's moving now. It's moving now. Okay, so I can do it. I can do it this way, uh, just in order to get it in move. Yes, yes, yes. It's moving. So I I was at that slide. Uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you for uh, uh, for for the note. Um, yeah. So what is international and domestic? What is the uh, what is the uh, the aim of this play or analysis. If an issue is domestic or made uh, pseudo-domestic or fake domestic issue, we have nothing to do with the private international law aspects. But if a private relation has relevant international content, then we have to manage, we have to solve it uh, through the methods of the private international law. But can the parties influence it? Can the parties make it fake, uh, or uh, or we can we can make counterfeit uh, um, foreign connection in the private relations? Uh, in general, I would say yes if uh, the choice of the applicable law is allowed um, in this situation. But previously. Um, uh, the relevant the relevancy of the foreign elements was always stated uh, by, by some objective connections and not through subjective connections, especially uh, regarding to jurisdictional clauses. Uh, if you have a look at the case uh, you see uh, listed on the screen, uh, in this regard, the European Court of Justice has dealt uh, the applicability of uh, of the Brussels one bis regulation, which is on the jurisdiction recognition and enforcement in commercial and civil matters. So it is a pure uh, procedural uh, uh, procedural private international law regulation of the European Union, uh, and says that the parties has nothing to do with foreign elements. It was just a pure domestic. It was just a pure domestic issue, what they concluded. But can you imagine that in a contract, which is concluded between two uh, um, in the same country seated domicile company, and they have just concluded and they have chosen a third country's court's jurisdiction. What could it cause? Two Hungarian citizens, two Hungarian private persons, companies, concluding with each other a contract and choosing the Slovakian courts, the Slovakian courts jurisdiction, of course, this choice will have maybe no effect, no effect on, uh, on the applicable law. But of course, on the same time, they can maybe with, in a restricted form choose, the uh, choose a different applicable law as well. But in this regard, uh, the European regulations are containing so public order rules. But exactly in this decision, the European Court of Justice has justified such a kind of choice of the parties on the jurisdictional clause. Regarding to this case, there are unbelievable many uh, discussions in the uh, uh, in the scholar in the uh, so scientific discussions, because if you believe, uh, if you analyze the risks, if the parties will be allowed to choose in a domestic issues a third country's jurisdiction, it can make or it can cause a kind of avoidance, the local countries, jurisdiction, course jurisdiction. So we can see that uh, that that uh, uh, the revolution of the European uh, European Union's uh, uh, regard regarding the private international law has been started with the so-called choice of law regulation. 
but uh, we cannot see the end of this. Uh, until now, there are almost no restrictions uh, regarding, to, regarding to this. So I would say, for example, a Hungarian court uh, seeing such a, uh, uh, such a uh, jurisdictional clause uh, would, uh, would refer to a public order. But the thing is that, that uh, this case will first uh, land or uh, would first depart at another pointed out chosen court. So it's, it's unbelievable risky what uh, the progress, uh, what was started uh, right now in Europe in this regard. So it should be restricted. Uh, now, um, go on very, very quick to a few pieces uh, of, the, of the international crime. Quite funny uh, releases and quite funny uh, uh, roots or footprints of the uh, of the original uh, solutions. In Hungary, there was no written uh, uh, there was no written um, uh, law. Uh, there was more um, so called customary law, or the kings uh, had the empowerment, uh, the power to. Uh, um, to, to, to rule uh, through decrees. This exactly had happened in the time of uh, the Middle Age before uh, uh, 1492, Matthias King, one of our biggest king of the Hungarian history, uh, had, has adopted a decree against Polish traders. You can imagine that the Polish traders, when they crossed the Hungarian kingdom uh, and they and they did. Uh, they they forgot to uh, to pay the bill. For example, with the uh, con uh, against the um, to the con uh, contractual party, no one could do anything. But next time, when another Polish trader has uh, has come to Hungary, the king uh, had the right to occupy. The another Polish trader's property, items, whatever, assets, just in order to make, uh, just in order to um, uh, uh, to 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 make to serve to serve justice and to uh, ful fulfill the previous uh, um, injured party's interests. So it was it was quite a funny. Uh, funny solution because uh, this decree had basically nothing to do with the contractual relations. Uh, it had it had basically nothing to do with anything. What we've uh, uh, any ideas what we know about uh, about law right now and functioning of the private law. Um, another very very easy solutions was solution was. Uh, making the foreign people as they would be so-called pseudo nationals. So this was the uh, this was the solution, the trick how uh, how the king and the leaders uh, uh, afterwards uh, try to treat uh, the foreign element. They just thought that everybody who can speak English, uh, who can speak Hungarian, out of the Hungarian kingdom's border, can be seen as Hungarians. So that's all. Um, Till the till the 20th century, we had we had no uh, written code uh, on international private law. The Code Civil uh, of Napoleon uh, had also only a very few sentences, but not a single uh, unique uh, codified version of the private international law uh, has or had existed uh, or were existed uh, in the European Union among the member states. The first draft which was made uh, uh, in this regard was a Hungarian draft between the two world wars. Uh, it wasn't adopted finally, it wasn't accepted by the, uh, by the parliament. Afterwards, of course, uh, uh, after the second world war, uh, even more and more European countries, uh, Switzerland, Germany, uh, France, uh, has also adopted uh, a in, a, in a unique a single codified version of the uh, of the private international law. Um, 
Savigny has uh, has one of the first who uh, who dealt among many other things, uh, uh, of course, uh, with a vision of a, universe, a uniform system of private intentional laws. Um, but um, but this vision wasn't followed by the uni uh, by the European legislators. They have turned it. Uh, they have turned to a separate to separate national systems. No matter that the Hague Conference on the International Private Law, which is an intergovernmental, uh, uh, non-governmental uh, um, international organization, uh, aimed the unification of the private inter international law uh, rules, has worked out many, uh, um, uh, many. Um, Modal agreements, uh, many uh, uh, international um, uh, agreements on different things, maintenance, for example, the relation between uh, family members and children, uh, kidnapping of the children, traffic accidents, so many situation oriented and situation based uh, questions were uh, carried out by the Hague Conference on International Private Law, which uh, required the tools of the private international law. And the Hague Conference in many situations has worked together with the European Union, for example, regarding to the maintenance regulation of the European Union, it was adopted by the Hague Conference oh, and, the, and the regulation refers on the protocol of it. The US American development Development of the private international law was uh, was was more more um, uh, oriented or influenced by the by the choice of the law revolution, uh, uh, and uh, until the the European way was was a so called fragmented situation oriented regulation which always wanted to localize the uh, every single to every single each situation the most favorable connecting linking factors <clears throat> just very quick the role of the european union in the euro uh, in the international private law uh, regulation uh, as you know the european union uh, is um yeah let's say kind of get together party of the european member states just in order to uh, 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 just in order to make some geopolitical uh, geopolitical um, um, role uh, uh, of the of the world in the globalized in the globalized world which suffers many many problems right now uh, because of the bureaucracy because of the biggest administration or uh, background and of course because uh, because of uh, the very big uh, uh, cross or change of the uh, change of the way uh, what they uh, what the European Union have to face uh, becoming more like the U.S. American system like a federalistic system or uh, or following the way of independent countries uh, which are uh, uh, cooperating with each other. Uh, with each other, giving up some uh, some part of their sovereignty in order to reach uh, separate, uh, in order to reach separate goals uh, laid down in the treaties. Um, of course, each uh, directions have its advantages. Of course, um, we cannot we cannot discuss it uh, at that uh, at that point but uh, what we see that uh, that the first empowerment the first competence which has new released uh, at the uh, level of the treaties was at the Amsterdam treaty from uh, 1999 uh, which has created a new competence on the field of uh, adopting measures uh, regarding to international private law the new uh, uh, treaty, which is uh, from 2009, the functioning of the European uh, Union, the so-called Lisbon Treaty, has uh, the label, the indicated uh, provisions uh, on this regard, creating a very clear competence for the European Union adopting measures uh, regarding to the private international law. Um, there was no theoretically reform behind it. It was just pure pragmatical and practical uh, uh, revolution behind it. Um, 
the whole European Union uh, works uh, uh, works on the basis in order uh, works on the basis to make better functioning the internet market. The new goal is a proper functioning of the internet market, which has created a need in order to improve the predictability of the outcome of litigation, certainly as to the law applicable and the free movement of judgments for the conflict of law rules in the member states to designate the same national law, irrespective of the country of the court in which an action is brought. So this is the several times repeated and reformulated goal uh, of the European Union uh, in this regard, why the EU tries to adopt even more and more international private law uh, regulations on this field. Of course, from the parts, from the fields of the private law, there are some things missing. For example, the natural persons, legal capacity. The European Union hopefully never will, never will try uh, to bear uh, adopt measures on it. It will, it will, hopefully, it will be left at uh, the member states' competence. Uh, law of the items, which is not so evident anymore, uh, and even more actual because uh, because the, for example, transferring the property is always combined with some act, with some contract, mostly, and if it's combined with an act. Uh, with a uh, with the parties act uh, with a uh, with the parties contract uh, the contract's characteristic can influence the transfer of the property the legal effects on the items on the property itself um so that's that that is going to be a very new tendency uh, in the european union in the very near future if you, are, uh, if you wanted to have a look uh, on the landscape of the current uh, international private law regulations in Europe, we have, uh, we have two pure procedural regulations. This is the Brussels one, this regulation on contractual and non-contractual obligations and in, in civil and uh, so the jurisdiction recognition and enforcement in civil and commercial matters. The Brussels two regulation on the same procedural uh, questions in any family matters. The Rome one, Rome two, and Rome Rome, uh, Rome three regulation on uh, on contractual non contractual uh, obligations, and the Rome three regulation is on uh, legal separation and divorce. Uh, but this is uh, adopted in a form of a enhanced cooperation, which means that not every member state has accepted it. So it is most of the member states has accepted, but not in all of member states, not in every member state uh, is this regulation applicable. We have a, a regulation on succession and wills with the full coverage, not just the applicable law, then the recognition, enforcement, and uh, 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 and jurisdiction of uh, of, of of judgments, uh, documentation, and so on, and and another enhanced cooperation on matrimonial property and the property consequences of registered partnership. Uh, it wasn't accepted by the Hungarian government, and of course we we can never forget. Uh, we can never forget the European Court of Justice interpretation of function, the so-called preliminary ruling process, uh, through which the European Court of Justice could have a significant effect uh, on, the, um, on the progress and development of the private international law. I will mention a few uh, cases for this. Typical problems and new, uh, and new solutions. Uh, we all know the effect of the so-called Ranvoa, uh, which which means the transmission or remission. Uh, I would I would say that no anymore no Forgo case. The Forgo case was was an was a very old, very much referred case uh, from the French uh, litigation history. Uh, Mr. Forgo uh, has uh, got uh, has married a. A very rich French woman and lived at the River Po in uh, in France, but uh, but had 
um, uh, had a registered domicile in Bavaria. Uh, the, uh, no, it's in Germany. And once, uh, once the uh, he uh, he overlived uh, his wife um, and had unbelievable big assets um, in uh, in 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 France. And then he also died. Uh, the French authority uh, wanted to uh, wanted to go uh, wanted to go on, and um, uh, and the fiscus, the French fiscus, wanted to uh, get uh, um, the succession, the legacy of the uh, uh, of Mr. Forgo. The question was which law to apply. The French international private law rule said that the registered domicile place of the domicile law should apply. The, Bav the Bavarian law, uh, which was those days uh, the Lex um, Maximilian Bavarian, uh, said that uh, uh, that basically um, not the registered, then the actual domicile uh, country's law should be applied. This jumping to another law and back, it can be made uh, endless, uh, it has to be stopped. This is why the European Union, leaving every single scholars and, uh, uh, and legal literature's opinion and statements behind, says that no renvoir, no transmission, no remission. Uh, we prohibiting it, we didn't, we, we don't accept uh, any renvoir effect. Uh, what we say, what is linked, this is always the direct applicable law and no remission and no transmission is accepted. Another, uh, another problematic is the classification. Sure, you also have many legal institutions, but different or other, uh, other states have never aware of this. Um, this is exactly the same in the European Union. We are different, no matter that, uh, that the life events of a private persons are always the same all over the world. Uh, uh, we are born, we die, uh, we, got, we get married, um, we will have the same private relations, no matter where we are coming from. Uh, but what the law or how the law answers or solves these situations, um, can be totally different, uh, depending on the cultural background, depending on the uh, uh, religional one, uh, social, cultural, uh, and of course, legal, political uh, aims as well. Uh, it makes the classification, the progress or the process of the classification even harder and harder. It means that, it means that the, that the European Union tries to uh, create autonom autonomous interpretation and own definition uh, um, without caring of uh, of the member states uh, member states definition. Another uh, methodological or theoretical revolution was dropping everything or almost everything to the parties' choice. If the parties can decide what their own interest dictates. Uh, they can choose whatever they want. So almost unlimited. Uh, the, the regulator, the legislator, only tries to restrict this unlimited free choice regarding to a few situations, um, uh, taking or having attention on weaker parties, uh, on children's interest and consumers and employees, whatever uh, so so some 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 favorable protectable interest uh, try to restrict the uh, the almost unlimited free choice of uh, applicable law but basically uh, the eu uh, want to want to uh, make the parties or want to get the parties choose jurisdiction and applicable law as well because it is much better than dropping this empowerment to the judge because the judge and the legislator behind the desk will never be able to uh, create 
the most appropriate linking factor for every single situation, for each situation, which can uh, which can appear in the reality. Um, <clears throat> regarding to creation or recreation of the connecting factors, we have also very new approaches. Uh, previously, uh, the method and the tradition was creating to every single contract type a unique connecting factors. Come on, this makes the whole in international private law system chaotic. Better to use general connecting linking factors as, for example, the most closely connection or the party's choice. It is much better. It's on the judge interpretation and discretion as well. If the parties, if the court can argument reasonably for this or that country's law applicability, then it's up to the judge. Much better than uh, than to try to create for each situation a single and unique connecting factors. Yes, I think you have two minutes. Two minutes more. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the selected examples of the legislatory outputs and case law uh, in this regard, um, I would mention that uh, if, for example, a Portuguese uh, citizen uh, married a Hungarian wife uh, uh, with a newborn baby at the Hungarian clinic, want to give the baby uh, a Portuguese name, like Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, uh, previously the Hungarian authority easily refused uh, to accept this name because it has nothing to do with the Hungarian rules. Uh, no matter that um, that the European Union had no competence on ruling uh, the private person's uh, uh, legal capacity and those kind of connecting questions, uh, the European Court of Justice, based on the so-called non-discrimination clause uh, and the free movement of persons in the internet market, has created new legal basis for uh, treating and handling these situations. So if it's uh, if the right to a name is based on any of the party's nationality, then it is allowed and should be accepted and registered as well in a different country. Go on very quick to the public order rule uh, in the EU and member states. The biggest clash uh, between, uh, between laws uh, always arises from, uh, from, uh, from European countries' uh, law, member states' law, and a different uh, oriental countries' law, Islamic law, uh, uh, mainly Chinese uh, and Indian, uh, Indian law. Um, in this situation, how, for example, the a typical, very typical national law, public order function can work. Um, first of all, we have to state that the public order is not a general rule uh, for discriminating between countries' law. It cannot be a tool for discrimination. If the private international law says that this or that foreign law should be applied, Referring on the public order, uh, the court won't be able to abolish or deny the application, the fully application of the foreign law. It can only cause a kind of correction. And uh, uh, what also can be seen or should be seen that uh, not just the pure content of the foreign law uh, will, uh, uh, will cause uh, the correction. What should be examined is the result. Is the result what in the individual single case the application of the foreign law would cause. For example, these principles are equal treatment of parties, people, husband and wife, uh, in the succession, family matters, divorce cases. In this regard, we can see selected outputs uh, and selected cases, several cases from the Hungarian, for, from the German, and of course, from many other 
uh, 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 countries, uh, courts, jurisdiction. Okay, I think I have reached my time limit, uh, maybe a few minutes, I'm uh, already over it, but I'm ready for the questions and ready for any other consultations yeah. right now and of course afterwards as well. Okay, so thank you for thank you for your thank you kind attention as well. Thank you, Dr. Zok. Let me summarize uh, your presentation in Bahasa in our own language. Uh, okay, students. Uh, jadi luar biasa. Jadi Bapak Dr. Zok ini tadi mempresentasikan terkait dengan perkembangan uh, ilmu hukum perdata internasional. Seperti kita tahu bahwa menurut beliau dan juga konsepnya juga sama seperti apa yang ada di Indonesia dan di banyak negara bahwa hukum perdata internasional itu mengatur hubungan keperdataan yang dia mengandung unsur-unsur asing. Dan tadi disebutkan bahwa di Uni Eropa perkembangannya sudah sangat luar biasa karena mereka itu memiliki uh, semacam regulasi di Brasel 1, 2, dan banyak regulasi itu tadi yang mana agar terjadi uniformitas atau keseragaman pengaturan tidak hanya di Hungari tetapi juga di negara lain, di Belanda, dan juga di negara lain, yang tujuannya itu nanti terjadi keseragaman pengaturan terkait dengan hukum perdata internasional. Dan tadi sangat menarik sekali, perkembangan sejarahnya juga sangat luar biasa yang ada di Hungaria, seperti tadi kalau melihat dari sejarah, pernah suatu ketika Raja Matias itu dia salah satu raja yang ada di daerah Hungary, dia membuat semacam peraturan, yang mana peraturan itu berlaku tidak hanya untuk orang Hungaria sendiri, tetapi juga untuk orang Polandia pada saat itu, Polish traders gitu ya. Dan itu juga uh, mengatur sehingga mereka ini tidak bisa dirugikan gitu ya ketika mereka berdagang. Dan dalam perkembangannya juga, tadi menyebutkan ada pengecualian penerapan dari uh, pengaturan yang ada di Uni Eropa. Jadi Uni Eropa ini, mereka membuat pengaturan, tetapi juga masih memberikan kelonggaran atau kedaulatan kepada masing-masing negara untuk mengatur hal-hal spesifik lainnya terkait dengan natural person, jadi terkait dengan status personal, kemudian yang kedua terkait legal capacity. Tadi disebutkan misalnya ada orang Hungaria, dia menikah dengan orang Portugis, Portugal, dan misalnya namanya diberi anaknya diberi Cristiano Ronaldo, dan dia men, apa, lahir anaknya itu di Hungaria, maka namanya itu tidak akan bisa diterima. Dan ini merupakan bagian dari pelanggaran dari ketertiban umum yang ada di Hungaria. Jadi berkaitan dengan pemberian nama saja itu diberikan kelonggaran dan uh, apa uh, kelonggaran dan juga untuk um, mengembangkan adat istiadat yang ada di mereka. Saya kira itu mungkin sebagai kesimpulan dan kita membuka sesi tanya jawab. We only have 15 minutes from now for the session, or maybe not 15 minutes, 12 minutes. So hopefully uh, there will be some students asking the questions. Okay. Uh, 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 please, if the uh, if you have any question, please, okay. I have Irfan here. And is there anybody wants to ask question? The other? Okay, so Irfan, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hajinal, for the opportunity to explain uh, to us about this international um, private law. So uh, I, I want to ask about the problem that we, we face in Indonesia also in another state. It explains that if we as Indonesians or as the uh, public government had as a pattern um, individual or personal personal corporation that located in international office or the international relations either is in the foreign state or in another state except Indonesia and it happens a lot of many problems how does do we resolve it maybe for example we have um, a corporation located in Hungary and there is a problem with that corporations it is our obligation or state obligation to resolve or we use the Hungarian law to resolve it because we as the Indonesian uh, Indonesian people need a specific law for implementing this solution. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, I think I would like to summarize the question. So the question is uh, more about the state 
own enterprise. You see, mm -hmm. in Indonesia, we have state-owned enterprise. If they are dealing business with European, then uh, there is a problem in, in, in that private relationship. Um, uh, which law is applied? And because it is dealing with the state-owned enterprise where the majority of shares is owned by the state, can they also sue the state or they are suing the uh, the CEO or the director of the corporation? <clears throat> I think the, um, yeah, the question is quite problematic uh, because of uh, the different interests and uh, and one party is, uh, is a pure uh, holder of the sovereignty or, or at least a, uh, uh, a pseudo holder of the sovereignty um, and others are just uh, private uh, contractual parties. But I think uh, in a pure commercial relation, uh, it is uh, it is up to the party's choice uh, what law uh, to apply uh, for uh, for the private relation, for the contract itself. Um, uh, what uh, what courts jurisdiction to point uh, to point it out if it's uh, on a for example on a foreign direct investments um, in this regard the the international uh, international customary law uh, international guiding or guidelines and principles of uh, the foreign direct investments and of course agreements bilateral and multilateral agreements and of course there is a Washington DC based centralized uh, arbitration body uh, which uh, which is basically empowered after uh, after uh, choosing or pointing out its jurisdiction uh, to uh, to grant uh, arbitration awards for example in this situation otherwise what is what is quite common that um, that in such a situation uh yeah mainly the state is try to try to be bound to the applicability of the of the domestic law um, um but 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 um yeah but from the hungarian government's perspective as well uh they would point out some 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 universal law if it for example if it's on on sales of good international sales of goods that could be easily the uh, Vienna convention supplementing it with some uh, the gaps with some national law and 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 principles of the international uh, trade and commerce for example the unidroa uh, principles but which is very very well and very much common nowadays uh, to write such a contract, which is fully based on uh, the party's will, uh, which will be justified by the party's signature, uh, and, and which will behave like an act, so detailed, uh, and, um, and 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 of course the representatives of the parties, the for law firms, cooperating in such an issue, uh, will. Uh, we are create with a full coverage uh, uh, a documentation package uh, thinking on every single and potential uh, uh, conflict areas uh, and try to give uh, a full code of contracts for this special unique issue. Um, so this is which is which is very very common nowadays um, uh, to incorporate everything into a contract between the parties so um, i'm not sure if i uh, if i satisfied your 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 questions uh, but if if the parties are in choosing uh, applicable law and jurisdiction uh, the the general jurisdiction clause uh, in under the european uh, legislation is the defendant's place um of course the prorogation of the parties is, uh, prorogation agreement is also allowed uh, and if it's on a service or a, or a sales of goods, uh, the seller and the service providers habitual residence law will be in general uh, applicable uh, if the parties uh, haven't chosen any applicable law uh, in the contract. So these are the general rules. Thank you. Thank you. And 
I think, uh, is there any question from students? If not, because we still have a very limited time, just only five minutes. Okay. Uh, there is no further question. I would like to have question for you. So uh, I, it is so interesting to have your PowerPoint. I recalling your lecture last time when I took a PhD program last time. Uh, the, the, the thing that I would like to highlight is about the exception from the EU regulation on private international law. You mentioned about natural person and also legal capacity. So while yeah. the EU provides this kind of area becoming uh, absolute jurisdiction of each member state, is, it, is that because to protect their culture, to protect the root of their uh, domestic uh, situation? Or is there any other reason why mm -hmm. Area natural person and legal capacity do not regulate by the EU. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. The question is why. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, you have to see that uh, that originally the European Union was just a pure um, uh, economic cooperation between the member states, uh, supplementing these directions with some. Uh, still very uh, economically oriented questions uh, which aim to maintain the, the European citizens' life niveau on a high level, like social security, consumer protection, environmental protection, and so on. But everything was strongly connected to the functioning of the internet market. Um, on the one hand, uh, the Europe uh, the European Union's uh, um, uh, uh, com uh, competences are restricted to those uh, or limited to those areas which are connected with the goals, with the with the European, with the aims of the European Union and the internet market. Uh, since the European Union uh, laid down that it won't go into the private relations. Uh, it is from one side a limitation, but on the other side, uh, the European Union has has very good, uh, very good general competences. For example, referring on the discrimination, which is direct applicable uh, and has direct effect in the member states as well. Um, on the non-discrimination clause, the European Union can or is able to go deeper in the private relation. Just for example, imagine that uh, that this, the same sex marriage in Europe is a is a is a very hot topic. Uh, there are countries which uh, which have created uh, its own marriage similar uh, or 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 marriage marriage like uh, partnership rules uh, for the same sex couples. Uh, Hungary has also allowed this kind of partnership, but not it cannot be seen as a marriage. It is a, in our constitution. Wife can be a man and uh, wife can be a, 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 a woman and man can be a, a, a husband or husband can be a man. Um, there are some differences, very similar, but there are some differences. Um, what to do if the, EU, if the European Union once upon a time will wake up and sees that it is a pure discrimination between, uh, on the basis of the equal treatment of the natural persons between same-sex couples and different sex couples. Mm. Could still didn't reach that level, but basically there are no obstacles. Yeah. So, the, the, the right and direct question uh, answer on your question is that there is no direct competence on 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 uh, on ruling the the natural persons uh, uh, legal capacity, for example. It is still purely belonging to the uh, to the member states' uh, sovereignty and competence. Okay, so direct competence concept. Okay, yeah. so thank you very much, Dr. Zolt. It was very fruitful and uh, full understandable for the presentation. Uh, hopefully, you can also share the PPT so that yeah, sure, I can, I can, I can send it to you right now, and right. and you yeah. can, you can share it with, with those.
who yeah. are interesting. Yeah, thank you very much topic. again. And because it, we have very limited time right now, because okay. it is night here, uh, you have afternoon there and here night. Okay. <laughs> so we, we this is the time for us to sleep <laughs> as well as yeah. for okay. So, so thank, thank you for the opportunity. Much. Thank you very much for the presentation and also uh, 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 for uh, for the very wonderful uh, materials and substance on inter uh, private international law. And hopefully the students will get any benefit from and also advantage for, from this session. And thank you again, Kusunyum Sepan. And uh, please let's close our meeting today by reciting. Okay. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon there. Have a nice night. Thank you once again. Everybody here in the Zoom online. So hopefully we will stay in touch. Okay. Bye. Sure. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.